Hey, my name is Steve, also known as Terramantis, and this is my channel, Vitcha. For those of you who don't know, Bandai Namco flew me out to San Francisco where I was able to get some hands-on time with Dark Souls 3. I was able to play two different pre-built characters, an armored knight and a bandit-like warrior. This video will be a very digestible format, but at the end of the video I'll discuss a long-form video I want to do based off your questions, which will dive much deeper into certain aspects of Dark Souls 3. But for now we're going to talk about 10 things you need to know about Dark Souls 3 gameplay. Alright, so the first topic is performance. The version I played was on the PC with an Xbox One controller and the game ran smooth as butter, about 98% of the time. There was definitely times where the frame rate would slog for a brief moment. Now the reason this is important to point out early in the video is because what I'm about to say should apply to all topics moving forward, and that is that this was obviously an early alpha build of the game, meaning the game is complete for the most part, but the next 8 months or so will be spent fine tuning various aspects of gameplay and optimizing the performance. Alright, since that's out of the way, let's talk about some more interesting stuff. The Dark Souls info you're really here for. Let's get into the death and bonfire mechanics a bit. So is Dark Souls 3 like Demon Souls, where one death will take away half your health? Incremental like Dark Souls 2 or something new altogether? How does hollowing work? And the answer is, I simply don't know. The build was clearly made for demonstration purposes, and upon death, pretty much nothing would happen to my character. I die, respawn at the bonfire in human form, and have all my Estus swigs back. So I'm not sure how hollowing will work just yet. What I can say is that bloodstains seem to operate exactly the same as previous games. You have one chance to make it back to where you died to recover your bloodstain and regain your souls. Finally, if you know the lore of Dark Souls, then you know that bonfire checkpoints are actually comprised of cremated remains and bones from sacrificed hollows. Well, this time around, you'll be able to create your own bonfires with corpses of enemies. Now, this wasn't in the demo, but it was in the trailer, so I don't know how the in and outs work exactly, but it's definitely in the game. Alright, so let's talk about something I do know a little more about. The healing and Estus Flask system. First of all, it would seem that the life gems of Dark Souls 2 have been removed. I mean, green blossoms, throwing daggers, firebombs, weapon resin, and divine blessings were all present in the demo. I feel as though if life gems were still part of the game, they would have made an appearance, but they didn't. Also, Estus has changed as well, but let's talk about that in the next topic regarding combat and feel. My first impressions of the combat of Dark Souls 3 is that it feels very much like a Souls game, meaning combat is all about weight and precision, methodical combat. That being said, it does feel a bit smoother, more fluid, and slightly faster than before. Not quite as fast as Bloodborne, but somewhere in between Bloodborne and Souls. Even the Estus Flask has taken on characteristics of the Blood Vial from Bloodborne. It's not quite as quick to activate as the Blood Vial, as a matter of fact, the animation to chug Estus is about the exact same speed as Dark Souls 1, but the health restoration is now instant instead of taking time to refill. Now as for the combat animations themselves, character movements look, operate, and feel exactly like Dark Souls' first installment. Meaning weapon strikes, attack, moveset combinations, the kick, the parry, the repost, the backstab, running, rolling, plunging attack all feel exactly like they're ripped from Dark Souls 1. That being said, the backstab does feel as though it's changed a bit. It's pretty much instant like in Dark Souls, but it was definitely more difficult to land. I think this is due to a smaller, more acute window at which the backstab is available to execute. Now speaking of execution, you're going to need the right weapon for the job, and in the hands-on demo there are several weapons showcased. A one-handed axe, a straight sword, dual scimitars, a great sword, throwing daggers, and firebombs. Now most of these weapons had very similar movesets to Dark Souls, but some aspects have changed. For example, it would seem as though the dual scimitars only take up a single item slot, wherein you wield one blade in your main hand while the other one sits on your waist, allowing you to use an offhand item like a shield or a torch. But when pressing your two-handed hold button, you remove the weapon from your waist and place it in your offhand. This was sort of similar to the way the Blades of Mercy only take up a single slot in Bloodborne, but can then be transformed to wield two. Also, every weapon and or shield combination had its own battle art. Now essentially battle arts have replaced the left trigger button on the controller, meaning now the left trigger does something unique depending on what you're wielding. For example, with the kite shield, the battle art would simply do the traditional parry animation. But with the larger round shield, the battle art did not parry. Instead, it performed a war cry, like the dragon armor of Dark Souls or the beast roar of Bloodborne. It would also apply fire to your main hand weapon for a short duration. The greatsword, on the other hand, was given a new set of attacks when using its battle art, allowing you to hit the left trigger to momentarily enter a special stance and then choose your weak or strong attack to perform two new attacks, 
one that would lift enemies up into the air, and the other one that would break blocks, essentially giving the greatsword four different attack combinations. Now the straight sword was the only weapon class in the demo that allowed you to hold the left trigger and enter the ready stance and maintain the battle art, lifting the sword up to shoulder height and then move around offensively and defensively. It was sort of like Geralt from Witcher 3. Now finally, one of the most important aspects of battle arts is that they seem to operate very similar to Quicksilver bullet charges of Bloodborne, meaning just under your stamina bar there was an icon of a sword with a number next to it. And whenever triggering a battle art, like the sword breaking lunge of the greatsword or the shout of the round shield, it would remove some of these charges, so battle arts cannot be spammed. But unlike Quicksilver bullets though, the charges would refill upon death or resting at a bonfire. On a final note, I believe battle arts are meant to replace the power stance of Dark Souls 2. As far as I know, the power stance has been removed from Dark Souls 3, and personally I think the battle arts are more than a fitting substitute. All the weapons we were using were just mundane, normal weapons. I can't wait to see what boss weapons will have up their sleeve in the way of battle arts. Now all these new additions to weapons and battle arts are important because enemies of Dark Souls 3 feel smarter, or at least their movesets are more fluid and harder to distinguish at first. Of course there was the easy to kill hollow that would wildly swing away, only requiring a sidestep and a spam of attacks to kill, but some specific knights were very difficult to defeat. They might swing to a miss, only to shield bash to their side and knock you off balance into a stagger after you try dodging. They were definitely quick and adapted seamlessly to my attacks or dodges to counter my actions intuitively instead of feeling like they were locked into a rigid moveset. Don't get me wrong though, there was definitely patterns to enemies, but the battle situation simply felt more natural and organic. Now besides the knights, there was a slew of different enemies just in the demo. A ninja-like hollow, zombie dogs, a stone dragon like Kalami, and a gigantic chrome knight, almost the size of Smo. The giant knight was definitely intimidating to look at, but honestly, he was probably one of the easiest enemies to kill in the entire demo. His lumbering attacks and long recovery times made him easy to circle and backstab. But when low on health, it would use a panic spell similar to the Chaos Firestorm, but instead of pillars of flame, beams of light would expel from the ground. Needless to say, the enemies were pretty tough and had a great variety for a small area. But of course, tougher than the enemies always stands Dark Souls' infamous bosses. There's two bosses in the alpha build. One that was more of a Frost Knight mini-boss, and the other one was the Dancer of the Frigid Valley. I'd say the most interesting aspect of the two boss encounters was each of them had their own unique features. The Dancer, for example, had wild, unpredictable movements to her attacks, and after reaching about 50% health, would pull out a second sword making her even more difficult and sporadic. Also, the Frost Knight gave off some type of aura that applied a Frostbite debuff while in close proximity. The Frostbite debuff made your stamina sluggish like you were holding up a shield even when you weren't. Alright, now let's talk about some lore and narrative. First off, tombstones can be found around the environment to read for bits of backstory. For example, of the few in the demo, one read, To honor and shadowy retreats, fear the sun's temptations and the winged executioner. What does this mean? I have no clue, but it sounds pretty cool. Another tombstone read, Grave of the Nameless Retainer, raised his sword for the Lord of Cinder. Now we know that Miyazaki confirmed the CG trailer was depicting the resurrection of a Lord of Cinder, and the player character's quest would be to seek out and defeat these lords. Additionally, this coffin, which also came accompanied with other press assets, depicts another gigantic coffin different from the one the giant lord was in. I believe these different coffins are housing various dead Lords of Cinder. Now I don't know how related this is to the overall story of the Lords of Cinder, but the two bosses in the demo were definitely connected. Upon defeating the Frost Knight, a tombstone could be read which stated, Died in solitude, may his soul find its way back to the Frigid Valley. Obviously the other boss was named the Dancer of the Frigid Valley, so they're both from the same place. But the thing is, when entering the boss encounter with the Dancer, it crawls out of what looks like a black portal. Additionally, the screenshot of the Dancer was accompanied with some text that read, Armored enemy with abnormal form that is called Dancer, wearing thin silver armor and white long veil. It is said that she comes from another world, Frigid Valley. So these item descriptions, in combination with the way the Dancer crawls out of the portal, makes me believe that the Frigid Valley is an alternate dimension or plane of existence. But will we get to travel to the Frigid Valley firsthand? Now that would be interesting, but I have no clue. Alright, now as with every Souls game, the environment that surrounds you tells just as much of a story without words as item descriptions do with them. And Dark Souls 3 is no different. There's a dead stone dragon in the environments and hollows were praying to them. Certain sections were filled with dead soldiers with spikes and spears driven through them like a massacre or war happened in the streets of this kingdom. 
The environments were rich with detail and begging to be further inspected. Now as for the actual environment layout itself, it was very much like demons and dark souls. The construction of the world was vertical with twisting and alternate paths with shortcuts, elevators, and keys to unlock previously locked gates. A wrong turn or misstep could see you plummet through the flooring only to find yourself surrounded by enemies on the level below. The world was exciting, well designed, and created tense situations. That being said though, I was disappointed with the overall layout. More often than not I might struggle and kill my way somewhere only to have my path lead to nothing. Now obviously this was more than likely because it was a demo version and they were trying to keep it contained within a specific area. But for the most part, that's exactly what I can say about it. It felt restricting, but that's probably what they were going for with the alpha playtest. Point is, I'm looking forward to the real exploration of this Dark Souls game when it comes time. Alright guys, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button. It really does help with searchability and goes a long way with the success of videos here on YouTube. It helped me out a lot and I'd really appreciate it. And finally, I'd like to do a video based off your questions because there's still a lot to talk about. To submit questions, please direct them to me on Twitter at Terramantis with the hashtag DS3Q&A. Twitter is simply much easier for me to manage. And in a few weeks, I'll make a long format video featuring your questions about the gameplay of Dark Souls 3. Alright guys, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.